We just witnessed something crazy in Turin. And unbelievable what he's doing, winning every tournament that uh, he goes. Which is quite funny because we already know what Novak Djokovic is capable of, yet somehow he just keeps raising the bar on himself. If I don't want to be humble and be honest, I'm winning the tournament. If I want to be humble, I'm also winning the tournament. Djokovic entered into the ATP Finals as the number one seed a week after securing his 40th Masters crown in Paris, and most of us considered him the overwhelming favorite for the title, but there was a plot twist. Novak was drawn in the same group with Yannick Sinner, Holger Runa, and Stefano Tsitsipas, and if you asked me, I thought he was going to win all of his matches and come out on top of the group, but here's what actually happened. A year-end world number one for a record eighth time was on the line for Djokovic, and he had that at the back of his mind coming into this match. Runa showed his intent early on in the first set and broke Djokovic in the fifth game, but was unable to hold his lead as Djokovic broke back immediately. Runa continued with the aggression and big serving in the epic first set, and a casual fan wouldn't have known that it was the lowest-ranked player in Turin giving the highest-ranked player a run for his runny, but Runa looked very solid with his ultra-aggressive tennis. The pulsating 72-minute first set went into a tiebreak, which Novak dominated. It was the same scenario in the second set, with Runa getting the early break but failing to consolidate. However, this time it was Novak who would play a horrible tiebreak for someone who had won 29 tiebreaks this year, winning only a single point as Runa drew level. By the third set, Runa's fitness was already being questioned and his shot tolerance had reduced significantly. Once Novak made his move, there was no coming back. 7-6, 6-7, 6-3 your final score. Interestingly, Djokovic won the shorter rallies and was happy to move Runa around in the longer rallies. In general, I liked Holger's mindset and approach to the game, but some of his shot-making decisions were a bit questionable. Having secured his year number one status, Djokovic faced a red-hot Yannick Sinner in his second match, but this time, Djokovic's 19-match winning streak was on the line, and the home favorite effectively halted it with a brave display in front of the Italian crowd. Honestly, I felt like Novak served better and was just really choosing his spots. His 19 aces in the match proved just that, but Yannick Sinner on the other side was not missing anything. Sinner made his move at 5-5 in the opening set as Djokovic briefly lost focus after leading 40 love on serve. Djokovic then made his only double fault of the match at deuce before Sinner went on to convert and hold serve to take the first set 7-5. Djokovic then raised his level even more in the second set with quick service games, but he also couldn't break Sinner on the other side of the net, so the two went into a tiebreak. Clutch Nole then showed up and pushed the match to a decider. The third set was more dramatic with both players breaking each other midway through the set. The crowd got more involved and here's how Djokovic reacted. However, Djokovic played a largely forgettable tiebreak and Sinner got his first win over Novak in his fourth attempt, 7-5, 6-7, 7-6. The match lasted 3 hours and 9 minutes, and a combined 83 winners and 25 unforced errors tells you that the match was indeed high quality. With Tsitsipas retiring against Runa, everything changed in the green group. No player was sure of making it past the round robin stage, even Yannick Sinner with his two match wins. For Djokovic, he now needed to play the first alternate, Hubert Herkosh, and beat him in straight sets to make it to the semis. But that didn't quite happen. Pitted against arguably the best server on tour under the conditions, it was always going to be a difficult assignment for Nole. At least, more difficult than facing Tsitsipas at the time. Coming into the match, Hubi had only two straight sets defeats since Roland Garros this year, the first against Jack Draper at the US Open, and the second against FAA in Basel. And he wasn't in the best shape physically for those matches. Herkosh had no chance at making it to the semis because Tsitsipas inadvertently ruined his chances, but he was playing with a little extra motivation. 200 ranking points and nearly $400,000 in prize money on the line. As you would expect, Herkosh fired 24 aces past Nole throughout the match. The first set was competitive and neither player faced break points. It went into a tiebreak, but Djokovic was able to make exceptional returns while Herkosh missed some forehands in the tiebreak. It was drama on full display in the second set when Herkosh hit back in the fifth game to break Nole, and when Djokovic finally had a chance to break, Herkosh fired three aces to get himself out of trouble before sending the match to a decider. However, his first serves fell apart in the third set and he only made 45% of them as Djokovic handed him a breadstick. 7-6, 4-6, 6-1 for Djokovic, who is now 7-0 against Herkosh. For me, the biggest difference was that Novak won 73% of the points on his first serve, while Fubi only won a measly 32%. 
Anyway, not beating Hubi in straight sets meant that Novak needed a favor from Yannick Sinner, who ended up beating Runa in three sets. Having secured a spot in the semis, Sinner could have taken his foot off the gas a little bit, but he didn't, instead showing his competitive spirit. Nole is the one who ended up benefiting, though, and this set up an epic semifinal clash with Carlos Alcaraz. It was the first time since 2007 that a world number one faced a world number two in the semis of the ATP finals. On that occasion, Federer faced Nadal. The match served as a gentle reminder to neutrals that not every match would go the distance between these two. The Joker dispatched Alcaraz in only 88 minutes. Despite creating four breakpoint opportunities and sending down plenty of big serves, including 10 aces, Alcaraz couldn't find a way past Novak, and he also struggled to keep control behind his delivery, winning only 62% of points on first serves, which tells you that Nole was dialed in on the return. His forehand defense in particular neutralized heavy shots from Carlitos, and he was able to hit back with stunning cross-court shots a whole lot. 6-3, 6-2 your final score. Not the most flattering scoreline for Carlos, but here's what he had to say after the match. I feel like I'm, I am not in, in his level. Djokovic had now made it to his ninth ATP Finals final, and history was on the line. Sinner had everything going for him. The consistency, shot tolerance, and an uptrend in serve potency. He had beaten Medi for the third time in a row, gotten his first Ws over Djokovic and Runa, and was riding the wave of the Italian support. Before the final, Sinner had only lost serve twice the whole tournament, but Nole broke him three times in the final in a relatively straightforward affair that ended 6-3-6-3. What I noticed in the semis in the final is that Novak switched things up a little bit. Instead of relying on his consistent backhand and great elasticity, he was sending missiles off the forehand wing and absolutely shredding the baseline games of Alcaraz and Sinner. It kind of reminded me of his Australian Open title win this year when he brought out those big forehands. And guess what? He still wasn't missing, even when hitting big at almost 90 miles per hour. And when it came to serving, Djokovic was either hitting an ace or unreturnable serves. I can't remember when I last saw Djokovic serve so well. Shades of servebot, maybe? In the opening set, Djokovic won 20 of 22 service points and landed 73% of his first serves. I also remember seeing him hit three consecutive aces in the second and fourth games of the second set. In the first set, Nole made Sinner's clean ground strokes look so ordinary and routine, drawing out so many errors, and Sinner never really looked settled, but the truth is it had more to do with Djokovic's level, as we can see from this stat. He dragged Sinner from line to line with repeated shots straight ahead, putting him on the defense, and after only 38 minutes, Nole was one set away from the trophy. The second set threatened to follow the same pattern until Sinner finally saw an opportunity to break midway through the set, but Novak recovered with three big serves, and from then on, there was nothing much to talk about. Djokovic nailed the game plan and the execution. He won 29 out of 32 first serve points throughout the match, and just like that, he had gate crashed Sinner's party in what became the most watched tennis match of all time in Italy with over 6.5 million people. After the match, Sinner said this about Novak. He won 24 Grand Slams. So, the, <laughs> I don't know how many, I don't know the numbers exactly of, of the Master Series. And here he won now seven times, right? So, you know, it's... And he, his body is an in, is in an incredible shape and we're going to see him around for... I don't know how many years still. And that what I said on court is that he's an, an, ins uh, an inspiration because he worked throughout the whole years before when he was younger in the right way to get to this point. And then that's also one of my goals. After securing back-to-back -back championships in Turin, here's what Djokovic's title win means for our sport. A record eighth time for most year-end number one finishes. 98 ATP titles and 71 big titles. Seven ATP titles, the most for any player in 2023. Seven ATP finals, the most ever in history. 400 plus weeks as world number one. Now that's incredible, but seeing those numbers makes you kind of want to ask questions about that lost year all over again. Banned from playing six major tournaments in 2022 and another two this year meant that there were literally lost titles, slams, court time, and records for the Joker. You then imagine that those numbers would have been even more remarkable. Now that's insane. 
2023 has been a great year for Novak, but interestingly, it's not even his best on the tour. I'd maybe put it below 2015 and 2011, and maybe a shade above 2021. What do you think? But I found some comments on social media that I found a little hard to ignore. Let me put this out here. The quality of the upcoming generation of tennis players is far from poor. Alcaraz, Sinner, Medvedev, and Runa are exceptional players who all have beaten Djokovic a number of times. So making weak era comments for this current generation sounds a little silly considering that these same people said a few months ago that there was a passing of the torch, especially when Djokovic had a negative head-to-head -head against Carlitos and Runa and was getting whooped more often. Novak is like a cat with nine lives and he just knows how to reinvent himself better than anyone else. His mentality also is unrivaled. Even under a lot of pressure, Nole might make one or two mistakes when executing a plan, but you'll hardly see him making poor decisions like some of the younger generation, which in part is due to his vast experience. His mental strength doesn't just show up with how he handles the crowd or a tournament, it's easy to see with every single point that he plays. Really, it's up to the young guys to step it up. After another stellar season that saw Djokovic go 55-6, win 90% of his matches, the million-dollar question that everyone's asking is, what's next? Djokovic has made it clear that the four Grand Slams and the Olympics are his priority for 2024. Meanwhile, the young guns will still be looking to have another go at beating him. I don't know about you, but I'm super excited for the upcoming season with Rafa coming back. On the women's side, it's Naomi Osaka who would be making a comeback. What really happened to her? Find out in this next video right here.